In our last episode, you had mentioned that one of your goals for 2023 was to kind of go the opposite route of the way we've been going. So to stop overanalyzing things, to stop overthinking things, because if you think about it, it's actually kind of the opposite of what you want when you're actually doing the thing. Do you remember what you said? No, I think that's a fair summary. Okay. My complaint or feeling was that we've been taking this approach of just talking through a lot of stuff and thinking about a lot of stuff. And there's been a lot of benefit to that for me specifically, where I've just analyzed myself, questioned all of my habits and preconceived ideas around what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. I've tried to just kind of tear that down a little bit and rebuild in some sense what I'm doing and how I do it. But there's been this side effect of I wind up just thinking a lot about everything I'm doing. And in some cases, it becomes problematic on its own, where I'm just trying to do something and I'm overanalyzing it. And it's preventing me from doing that thing. And so... <laughs> I would like to spend lots of time thinking and analyzing and talking about that problem. Yeah. So, for instance, right in the second, I know that we're talking about not overthinking things. And because we're talking about that, I'm, and because I know we're being recorded, I'm trying to remember how to have a conversation. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to think, oh, my God, what's the thing that I have to say next? And I have a, a list of, you know, 10, 15 things I've thought about. But I'm just thinking, oh, my God, which one do I say next? You know, how do you what's the most natural, normal one to say in a conversation? <laughs> that would be an example of overthinking. Yeah, so I went with this one. <laughs> this idea of of overthinking or, or if you just take a lot of what we've talked about in the last year or two where we're kind of analyzing ourselves and you know reviewing what we've done or how we think and we've we've taken specific things and tried to review them and think yeah. about them while we're doing them and then we talk about them whatever you think about all of that stuff it has been extremely useful and helpful to both of us so it clearly has a benefit to think about these things, to overanalyze them, to review yeah. what you do, how you do it. There's a, a very big, clear benefit to that. However, if you do it at the wrong time, it can cause a lot of issues. And so my thinking with this next year is that I want to figure out the best times for you to think about things and then also know the time when to shut those higher thinking processes off you know yeah. when do you review stuff and when do you not think about anything and just go and just do the thing so i've been kind of you said it at such a good time and it kind of threw me off because it felt like a, a slap to the face of everything we talk about on here because but it was perfect and it, it kind of it lined up with how i've been feeling is that i just have this I don't know, this observer that just won't shut up. And I just, yeah. you know, keep reviewing things. And it it stops me from being able to just free flow and, and do certain things. So this next year, I also have been trying to plan a way to where I can just kind of relax and do things instead of constantly think about doing things. Sometimes that observer voice for me, actually, probably most of the time, often enough, it's literally me thinking about the podcast and how I would explain something or talk about something or what points I would want to make while we're doing this, like the podcast itself. That's kind of the scenario or dialogue that goes on in my head. So my inner monologue while I'm doing roughly anything is, oh, I just observed that this was harder today for this reason. And probably I could ex like this probably is this and I'll explain it like that. And I'm like rehearsing this thing in my head. And it's in a way, it's kind of good because it means that I get content for the podcast sometimes. But 
then it can be kind of debilitating where I really just want to do this thing that I'm doing. I don't want to have this dramatic inner dialogue explains right. scenario thing playing out. Um, I really liked what you just said about the timing of things, how you want to do the over analyzing or the analyzing whatever at the right time and then be able to turn it off at the right time. I thought about that quite a bit this week, trying to think about what does overthinking something actually mean? When we were talking about it on the last episode, we're kind of just using this expression of, oh, I just, I want to turn my brain off. I want to switch off and just do the thing. And I was thinking about that and thinking, I mean, that's an expression. We use it all the time, but that's not super accurate because you aren't turning your brain off. You can't. You know, your brain is an organ. It's alive and it's running 24-7. It's the same as your heart, right? Like your heart can beat fast. It can beat slow. But if it, you can't turn it off or you're dead. And it's the same for your brain. You know, it doesn't turn off when you're asleep either. We actually used to kind of think that, that it's just in this sort of low power mode where there's not much happening, but that's not really true. It's actually very active. It has all these different brain waves and all kinds of things going on. It's a very active process. It's just in a different state. And I think that I'm not trying to be literal and pedantic here, but I think that's kind of important to think about for this idea of not overthinking the goal is not to turn your brain off because you really can't do that like it's it's running it's going to be doing something the goal is to get your brain to think about the right things at the right time and when you're overthinking something for whatever you want that term to mean it, it really all comes down to thinking about the wrong thing you're always going to be thinking about something but when you're overthinking, you're thinking about the wrong thing. And you could right. you could think about uh, worry, for example. If you're worried about something, you're overthinking it. Like you're playing out a scenario and you're worrying at it. You're repeatedly playing it out over and over and over again in these tiny little permutations of what could happen. Oh, it could be this. It could be that. It could be this. And that's the wrong thing to think about because... Typically, you're worried about some future scenario. Maybe you have a job interview. You don't know how it's going to go. So you're imagining all these different possible outcomes. But that's not helpful to you because you can't know how it's going to turn out. There's just missing information. You wind up dedicating all your brain power to just repeatedly doing the same thing over and over again. Like that is one example of many of just thinking about the wrong thing. So I, I started watching or the second half of this course from Natalie Portman on acting. Oh, right. Just for fun. Yeah. And you brought this up like these... three times. This must be pretty good. Well, I am low key in love with Natalie Portman, but also it's just a really interesting course. Um, it does not seem that low key, but go ahead. But it's, it's cool to listen to. Okay. Maybe a high key. It's cool to listen to someone talk about something that you don't do and notice how many similarities there are. Mm. It, it seems as if every piece of advice she gives is all with the intent to get you to the point where you're just playing around in the, in the character. It, just, it seems like she, she caps every piece of advice with that. Just, you know, this will help you, you know, play around and, you know, get to that space where you can just play around. And so, I'm, you know, it falls in line with the don't overthink things. But she said yeah. one time she was doing this scene and she thought it was going well. And then the director called her out and said that she <laughs> said that she moves her eyebrows in an unnatural way or she moves them too much or something, something like that. Yeah. And she said that she was so thrown off by that. And it was such a, just such an odd thing. She couldn't stop thinking, of, of course, about, you know, her eyebrow movements. And so it totally ruined the scene. And she said she just, she couldn't get over that. But she said the guy was right, or the director was right. And after, you know, practicing with that, I, I don't know how you practice that or whatever. Not moving but your eyebrows weirdly. Yeah. After messing around with that, you know, after the scene and However long, she said that was a wonderful piece of advice that she got. It was just at the wrong time. And 
I thought that was perfect because it's, that's an example of great advice, you know, I guess. But it was just very badly timed. And so, it, you know, if you had just been told that advice, like, after the scene or something, then it, I guess it would have been perfect. But I think yeah. too many times that's how we treat ourselves. I mean, we... Okay, the other day I start painting. So I'm, I think about, you know, the, the part of the painting that I need to do. And I think, okay, I'll try to paint it this way. Because it was a, a section that was really kind of confusing me. So I think, okay, I'm going to try to paint it this way. So I start painting it that way. And then halfway through, I start thinking, oh, maybe I should have painted it the other way. You know, maybe I should have used a, a different brush or a different medium or whatever. And so I kind of flip flop halfway through what I'm doing. Right. And then it, and then I step away from it and I think, oh my God, this looks awful. And then I try to change direction again and I try to paint in a different direction. And it, of course, just ends up this giant mess. And it's just frustrating me. I keep telling myself, stop overthinking it. Just, just do it. Don't overthink it. But then I'm thinking, okay, I don't know how to do it. So how the hell am I supposed to do it without thinking about it if I don't know how to do it? And it's just driving me crazy. So I stop and I'm thinking, okay, how do I, how do I put this in the right order? You know, how do I not overthink it, but also think about it because it needs to be thought about. <laughs> so I came up with four steps, which sounds kind of like the scientific process, but basically sure. you come up with a theory and then you develop a plan you know, to get you to that end theory mm -hmm. or that end goal, then you carry out that plan and then you review. And that's it. Just just four steps. Come okay. up with a theory. So I came up with a theory. I developed a plan to carry out said theory. And then... What was that? Oh. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, I, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Came up with a theory. Came up with a plan. Just did the damn plan. Didn't, didn't think twice about it. Just did this did the plan, and then at the end, I reviewed. And it was just this clean, wonderful process of, you know, I, I thought about it at the beginning, I make a prediction, I just do the work that I decided to, to mm -hmm. do, and then you, you do it. And then at the end, you look back and say, did it work? Yes or no, whatever, and then you make adjustments. And that is what I did for planning out 2023, or at least the next three months. And it's been working so well of course, you know, at the beginning of every year, it works well for everyone. But right. to, to be fair, it's been almost three weeks and things are, are going extraordinarily well. And I know I'm jinxing myself, but whatever. Yeah. Looking and, forward to next week, you or your yeah, absolute yeah, exactly. mess. But I feel pretty confident in, in sort of what I've set up, it, especially if you compare it to the last six, seven months of total disaster where I've. I've felt awful about everything. So I, I've kind of set things up. I don't want to just ramble on forever, but I've kind of set things up to where, you know, the example you gave last time where you said, if you put a bowl of Skittles on the kitchen table, every time you walk past them, you have to make the decision, assuming you want to be healthy, you have to make the decision to not eat the Skittles every time you walk past the bowl. And you were saying, you know, that could lead, lead to infinite decisions that you have to make over and over and over again. And of course, you're going to fail at them or, or whatever, you know, every once in a while or whatever. But the decision you want to, to make is just one. You want to make one decision, and that's at the grocery store. You want to decide to buy the, buy the Skittles or not buy the Skittles. And then if you decide not to buy them, you're good. You don't ever have to make that decision again until you go to the grocery store again. Right. So I wanted to take that same logic and apply it to everything that I plan to do in 2023. And it was kind of tough at first, but let me just tell you a couple things that I'm doing because they're just working so well. I, I just okay. need to share them. But and if, if, okay. if this just, sorry, if this helps you, we, we could rev we could reserve next week's episode to fully talk about the 2023 plan and everything if you're really looking to get that out. So maybe give us a teaser and then we can just really lean into it next week. Because I would I would like to talk about that too for myself. Okay, let me just give a couple of things. So I wanted to do this with fitness. Like I 
want to work out. I want to run again. I haven't been doing that for a long time. How do I just decide once and for all to be the person that does these things? And I think I already told you this, but I signed up for a race in April and I'm going to sign up for another one in November. And that's been perfect because I decided to not buy the Skittles at the grocery store. I signed up for this mm -hmm. race and now I have this, you know, workout plan that hinges on me doing this for three months or three and a half months. And if I fail at that, I, I super epic fail and I don't want to do that. So it's, it's right. kept me working out, you know, pretty much every day. And I've, it's just been great. And so to me, that was applying the don't buy the Skittles. The other yeah. thing is that I had my computer shut off at 1030, which it will shut off tonight at 1030. So we'll have to wrap things up, but okay. Or in an hour or so, but we have no fear of that. Anyway, I set up my computer to shut off at a certain time every night because I wanted to go to bed. I wanted to decide to just go to bed at a reasonable yeah. time, you know, indefinitely to not buy the Skittles. So I set up my computer to just shut off. And actually, since I started doing that since January 1st, I haven't touched my computer except to do this and to record hmm. some videos on art because just the idea of it shutting off makes me, I guess it kind of forces some self-control on me. And then I just, I realize, oh yeah, I don't actually want to spend any time browsing Reddit or on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So I haven't even touched the computer and that's led to me just reading and doing all the things that I want to do. Okay. Last thing is I, I separated my day into two sections. So I just have the morning and then I have the evening. And you had mentioned that, you know, there's sometimes when you're not sure if you should run or if you should work out and it just kind of frustrates you. Mm -hmm. And there's just this dissonance of not knowing what is the best thing to do. So I just, I separated my day into two different portions, morning and evening. And I separated different activities to this. So in the morning, I work on my art stuff. In the evening, I work out or run or read. And that's pretty much it. I mean, you know, there's some normal house stuff that falls right. into those, but that's really it. And so I'm not waking up in the morning wondering, oh, should I work on art stuff? Should I just read? Should I work out? Whatever. I don't have to deal with that at all. It's just, I wake up, the only thing that I'm allowed to do, and really the only thing I want to do after a while is work on my art stuff. And then in the evening, the only thing I, I'm able to do is work out or run or read. And it's just been really really nice because it's just kind of it's given me the decision up front of okay this is my plan for the next three months because that's what we plan to do and that's what i've decided to do i've made those decisions i'm not going to question them and then if if something doesn't work by the end of the three months then so be it but it's taken this idea of not overthinking things from from day to day overthinking oh should i do this should i do that and then even while you're doing them, because there's been plenty of times where, you know, you, you go to work out and then halfway through, you're like, oh, man, I should really be doing, you know, I really should be reading this book or I should be, you know, doing whatever. And so it just causes this frustration and this this back and forth of questioning things. And so I don't know. I just I really like your Skittles example of trying to, to pinpoint where the decision is or, or I don't know. Does it? Does that yeah, all make yeah. sense? Okay. Hopefully that, that ties in. No, it for does. me, it and ties in. But okay. I, you've said a lot. And there's there's a lot of different like little points I want to kind of come back to. There's many ways to wind up in that state of overthinking. And I think what you're talking about and kind of describing with your plan and this new structure and way of looking at your day and the next three months and everything is really going after one of the biggest ones which is the decision part mm -hmm. and i've we've both been kind of talking through this over time but i've just started to notice how decisions are such a like they they have to be made at some point it is some fork in the path of time that has to be chosen that's the nature of a decision you do this thing or you do that thing and Part of my nature is to stretch those decisions out to where they're just kind of smeared across time where they're never really getting made, but they're getting 
thought about and I'm I'm considering the decision over and over and over and I'm not really making it. I'm never really taking the fork in the road. Like you're just saying, you know, with the Skittles thing, you're not deciding whether I'm going to eat candy or not. You're always deciding between this Schrodinger's Skittles bowl forever of eating them and not eating them for as long as they're ever around. And that's not great. Even if you don't eat them, you're still having to make that choice constantly. You're still having to right. have that mental overhead of struggling with this thing being there always. That's such a powerful thing for me that just never really, I, I did not grasp this before, that even if you make the right choice, you're still having to make a choice and making choices is exhausting. And so ideally you make that choice once in the right frame of mind at the right time and then that's it i mean hopefully it's the right choice well you know how people always say that you have a finite amount of of decision making or willpower whatever yeah of willpower and so you know people joke around oh well does that mean you only have you know 100 decisions in a day or 20 or whatever is is that why people wear you know the same black shirt every day or blah 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 i think I think it was Steve Jobs that made that popular. You know, he he wore the same thing every day so he wouldn't have to make extra decisions, right? I mean, it it yeah. is kind of turned into a joke, but also it's kind of a real thing. And I think that it's not as easy as okay, you know, you've made your 20 decisions today, now you're powerless and you're just right. you know, a zombie for the rest of the day. It's it's that decisions require so much out of your brain. They require uh, predictive thinking. I mean, you have to think through all of these different possibilities and yeah. and it requires a lot of focus. I mean, even just simple decisions. Well, okay, some very simple decisions don't require so much, but... Well, th that's I, I guess... not even true. I think simple decisions can require a lot. Like uh, that example I was giving of, you know, I wake up, do I go for a run or do I lift weights? simplest thing in the world right it's one or the other right. i'm i'm doing both x number of times per week it's not a huge deal sometimes i'm paralyzed by which coffee shop should i go to this morning i mean who cares right who cares they right. all have coffee it's all expensive it's whatever i'm going to a coffee shop but sometimes i'll just agonize over it. like oh, i could go here but it's usually crowded and if i leave a little bit late because maybe if the dog needs an extra long walk then it'll i won't have a seat and then it'll be awkward and i might have to like stand around or what like i just wind up taking the dumbest, stupidest decision, do I go to this coffee shop or that one? And it winds up just being this massive amount of mental overhead. Like, I'm not proud of that. I mean, it sounds kind of pathetic, like, man, just make a choice. But sometimes well, it winds up just being exhausting. I think what what's happening is that you're going down this predictive path in your mind and you are looking for that sign that says this is right or this is wrong. You're looking for it, but you you keep judging it against, you know, some sort of mental model of, of whatever that is. You know, you're comparing, you're comparing, and you're just waiting for it to line up, but it doesn't line up because you don't really have a you know a perfect mental model of what the right coffee yeah. shop is for a Tuesday afternoon. You know, so you're 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 flailing around trying to find that thing that says yes or no. And if, if something obvious came up, like, I don't know, one of the shops was out of coffee, well, then clearly you would go to the other one. Right. But there's there's nothing so obvious like that. So you can waste all of this time just going down this road, searching and searching for that right thing, but you just can't find it. And that just drains all of your energy. So something, okay, another thing I, I did for this year was I wanted to finish a lot of these books that I've started. And there's, you know, I have this list of books that I want to read, but I didn't have a place for reading before. I finally blocked out some time, got rid of the computer distractions. Now I have time to read. So now it's just a matter of, you know, grabbing a book and reading. Well, I didn't want to spend all that time trying to decide what do I read? You know, do I, do I buy a new book? Do I read an old book? Do I finish one that I've already, you know, read mm -hmm. halfway through? Whatever. I just wanted a simple list. So I listed all the books I wanted, you know, for sure wanted to finish that I've been wanting to finish and some books that I definitely wanted to read. I made that list and I'm not allowed to add any more until I read these. And so I've already finished like four books this year, not wow. enormous ones, but well, you know, as soon as whatever. you finish one, it's 
okay, I'm done with that. Let's just check the list and grab the next one. And it's not this, oh, you know, right. thinking back through my whole life and trying to figure out, you know, what's the best book that's going to, you know, make me smart enough to achieve my goals in the future, whatever. Like, I'm not wasting all of that predictive thinking or mental energy on this decision. It's just, it's right there. Like, I, I've already kind of done that. So, yeah. So basically, the big idea here, I think, is that, is to isolate a decision into this very narrow thing and don't let it pollute everything else where you're constantly making and remaking that decision while you're doing something or before you're doing something or whatever. Right. Is that a fair summary? Like your four step plan, which may have borrowed from the scientific method of make a theory, make your plan, do the thing and then evaluate. Right. Like the yes. point there is that you're kind of pushing the decision making and the evaluation to the ends where mm-hmm. you're coming up with the thing and then you're trying to isolate this chunk of, OK, I'm just doing the thing. I'm not evaluating. Yeah, because before I did that, <laughs> I still do this all the time. It's not like yeah. it's a solved problem, but I I think, OK, I should try to do this method. So you start that method before you get halfway through it. You're already changing your mind. And then you back up and you review it and you're like, oh, my God, I suck. Like, you know, I'm, I'm no good. This is horrible mm-hmm. because you're in review mode and then you flip back. You just keep going back and forth when really if I would just carry it through to the end and then back up and, and review it, it would make a whole lot more sense. So I'm just I'm skipping steps that, that shouldn't be skipped. I think I think there's really two sides to that that are very important. One is what you just said, which is you're trying to not be making decisions when you're in do the thing mode, right? That's very important. But the other side of it too is that oftentimes, okay, here's a specific example. I, I've been working through this and it's a lot better. And we maybe I'll save more of this talk for next week when we talk about plan stuff. But the the fitness workout schedule was just really giving me a lot of trouble because Right now I'm doing a keto diet, which is what it is, but it, it's making working out kind of tough because I just don't have quite as much energy as normal or, or I fatigue faster, but I have all these fitness goals that I want to do. So I kind of built this plan and I, I spent time on it. I thought it through and I thought, okay, well, I, I really want to do concurrent training where I'm doing running and I'm doing lifting. So here's the plan. And I, I worked out all the scheduling of, okay, in the morning, wake up, walk the dog, go for a run then later on a break i lift weights and here's the weightlifting program and the progression and all this stuff like i have i did the planning i have the plan and then it's okay you know mike do the heads down do it person now you got to do the plan but the problem was that the plan was a fantasy plan i didn't really realize this but it was it was way over ambitious for like maybe in my absolute best state i could do it but i'm not in my best state i'm doing this weird diet i haven't really adjusted to it fully yet and so i'm just getting exhausted and this kept happening where i would do the plan and i would get to the middle of the week and i'm just fried like my heart rate is just high all day long i'm not sleeping that well like i'm just not able to recover from being able to do the thing and so i'm going Ugh. I could probably push through, but it really doesn't feel good. Just objectively, it's not me wussing out. It's actually just too much. And so it's like the planning version of me and the doing it version of me were not really in agreement Mm -hmm. where planning version needed to be more, needed to be less, I don't know, fantastical or think, oh yeah, I'm going to, you know, cut two minutes off my 5k time this month and i'm gonna you know put 10 pounds on my bench press like that's not realistic but planning version of me isn't actually having to do it so it's all fantasy and i think both sides of that are really important because if you wind up just planning poorly and i I think everybody is very familiar with this and probably has at least some tendency to do it especially like the new year's resolution thing right everybody comes up with some stupid thing of I'm going to do a billion push-ups a day because it's just 
it's this fun thing to think about at the start. And then when you actually get into doing it, you're like, wow, this is not possible. I can't do this every single day, even when I'm sick, even when I'm on vacation, even when I'm exhausted, like it doesn't work. So you wind up like the planning you is kind of dumb or just unrealistic, but then there's always this fallback of, well, I'll just reevaluate when I'm doing it. So you kind of have to balance those things If you need to have a good plan, like a real one that you can really do. And then when you're actually doing it, you need to trust that it's a good plan and that you're able to do it. And that lets you separate those things out where, okay, decisions can happen here, implementation can happen here, but you're not constantly having to second guess. Like I had to second guess my plan because I was thinking I was just going to kill myself trying to do all this stuff. So I had to go back to it and think, okay, let's completely reevaluate. I need to not be you know, agonizing over these decisions all week long, every morning of like, oh, do I feel good enough to go for a run? Can I do that kind of thing today? You know, is it going to make my shin splints worse? Is it going to, you know, fry me again where I can't sleep or whatever? Like that, I can't be dealing with that when I'm trying to do it. So anyway, the point is like those things have to be balanced out and it's it's not an obvious thing. No, not at all. And I... I did the same thing. So I, you know, came up with all this stuff, whatever. The first week I go through it and I I realized towards the end of the week, everything had gone really, really well, except the mornings I hadn't made the rule of no reading in the morning. So I had, my reading had started to take mm-hmm. over my mornings, which completely uh, obliterated all of my art. So I basically made no progress that first week because I, mm-hmm. the art is such a, just such a heavier thing to do. It's it's very easy to sit down and read in the morning. It's a little bit more difficult for me to sit down and start painting or figure out how to do, you know, these difficult areas of the painting, whatever. So I kept pushing the painting. And by the end of the week, I'm thinking, oh my God, I've done basically nothing. And that's a problem because this is my number one priority for the year. And if I'm not doing it, then that's a yeah. big, that's a big problem. But everything else is working great. So I... I, after that first week, I decided, okay, only reading in the evenings, the morning has to be the art. And then for the second week, it went, it went much better. So I've made some progress in the second week. Right. So you do have to review, but you know, you have to give it a good run. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm giving advice off of two and a half weeks of doing something, but, but I think, I think that, you know, you have to make those plans. And that's sort of your, you know, projected path of how it's going to go. But you don't know if you can do that or not until you get to the to the end of that, or you've you've run its course for a little bit. So, yeah, yeah. I, I I mean, I think it it certainly depends on what you're doing, but having a relatively short cycle of make a plan, do the thing, I think is yeah. usually good for me, especially if it's something I don't have a lot of confidence in. If I mean, I could make a plan for reading books and i kind of know how that's going to go for me reading books i'm not too worried that it's gonna screw up my life but if it's a a workout plan that i've never tried or on top of a new diet that i've never really tried before uh you know that's kind of a big unknown and so i think having the shorter cycle time of okay i'm gonna try this for one week and then reevaluate and see where i'm at objectively you know that is pretty helpful i wouldn't want to commit to two months of doing it because that's just so long i I might get halfway into the second week and realize it's going to kill me. I remember about two years ago when we had first, it was one of our first episodes and I'm telling you, you know, I'm really frustrated about, about all this stuff. I have all of these plans, you know, I, I need to get back into oil painting. I want to draw all day long and I want to, you know, make all these pictures and I need to, I need to work on my figure drawing and I need to do this and that. I need to read these books, whatever. But I work all day long and I have no time for this stuff or whatever. And it, it's just like, it's driving me crazy. And, and you say, yeah, I think you just suck at scheduling. And I was like, I, I was looking for s- some kind of sympathy or just understanding. And instead you're just, no, you suck at scheduling. And and you were right. You were you're dead on because I when you're planning, you can be so ambitious and, and dream the dreams. Yep. And so, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw for 70 hours a day and I'm gonna do this and that. And uh then you start doing it and you realize, oh, this doesn't make any sense at all. Mm-hmm. And 
you know, the general attitude is, you know, buckle down and do it and just be tough. But in reality, you just can't if it doesn't make any sense. And so you do need to review and you need to make realistic plans that you can actually stick to. And then, you know, if there is some some room to expand or whatever, then you start expanding. But, okay, I'm wondering if we can zero in more on the, like, actually performing something or more of yeah. the act because we're kind of talking about big broad strokes of planning right. and planning overthinking that yeah but I'm wondering if we can get more into like a yeah. singular event yeah so yeah like i said i think that overthinking it really there's a lot of different ways that it happens and, and the decision making thing okay we just talked about that that's certainly a major part of it especially on a day-to-day you know, going about your life type of basis. But yes, there are other other things that happen too. I was listening to this interview with Tim Henson, which is the guitar player from Polyphia. I was showing you some of their stuff recently. Looks like an anime character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of yes. came to life. Yeah. Okay. He's I forget the guy who's interviewing him, but he's just talking about, you know, these these things that he plays and he's this very accomplished guitarist and plays you know just these really intricate complex things and he's talking about how he performs and he has to play these really difficult riffs and how he can't play it if he's thinking about it if he if he starts thinking about what he's doing he messes up um and so he has to kind of be in that right state of mind where he's not thinking about the thing he's doing and then it can just come out right and we talked about this particular thing at length with memory and music and everything and we don't i don't want to rehash all of that but the important point i think is that there's different types of thinking and we tend to call the thinking in words thinking when you say oh i'm thinking about it that's kind of what you picture at least that's what I picture. Like there's a bunch of words going through your head of what if I did this? What if I did that? Right? Thinking. But that is not the only way to think or the only way for your brain to operate. Now, you can visualize things. You could close your eyes or, or not and you could picture a cow and then you could rotate that cow around in your mind and then you could put it on a hilltop and you could do a bunch of stuff. You could do imagery and visualizations and there's no words that need to happen there. And you're having thoughts, you're thinking about this cow, but you're not thinking in words. You can also think in feelings. You know, you can, and this, you have to kind of practice this a little bit because most of the time when you remove a bunch of stimulus from yourself, you start to get this like narrative in your brain, but you can pay attention to feelings. You can pay attention to the sensations in your body, you know, the feeling of your feet on the ground and that actual sensation, you know, or the, the clothes on your back and on your body. You can pay attention to those feelings too. And you are still in a, you're thinking, but not in the way that we think of when you say that you're thinking. This is kind of a weird thing <laughs> to explain, but are you with me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. So when Tim Henson I think is so. okay, <laughs> good, <laughs> good. Um, I think you are too. So when Tim Henson is thinking about when he's thinking, and he shouldn't be, really, what's happening is he's thinking about the wrong thing. And right. again, we've been over this a little bit. That's a very easy thing to do when you're trying to perform because the type of thinking that you want to do when you're performing this very complicated thing has nothing to do with thinking through a bunch of words in your head. You don't want a narrative. That is not helpful to you. That's just taking your brain and putting it in the wrong place. So it's overthinking in the sense that you are thinking about the wrong thing. The only realistic narrative that ever pops into your head when you're in front of an audience performing something and i know this firsthand is Ugh, here i am on stage doing stuff i hope i don't mess up 
probably gonna mess up. I sure hope I don't. Man, did I messed up? Did they notice I messed up? Like it's that's the type of narrative. Those are the words that are in your head. But really, you want your mind focused on the sensations in your body. And then the other thing that we discussed was visual imagery, like you picturing what you want your body to do. Now, I'm in my opinion, that's the the best thing to have in your head if you can, because it's it kind of occupies that conscious part of your mind very well, where you can think about that thing, but it still lines up and helps you play. But even absent that, if you can, even if you're purely relying on muscle memory, you want your brain dedicated to the physical sensations in your body. And you want it just doing like executing the muscle memory without thinking in words. So I guess the, the difficult thing here is that, one, you can think in completely different ways. Having a bunch of words flowing through your brain is not the only one, even though we just don't often reflect on that. And then, two, you can practice those things. Thinking in words is by far the easiest. It, it can be maladaptive, in fact, where you, you can't stop thinking about these things or kind of saying these things over and over in your head. It's certainly the most, like, it's the easiest one to latch onto. But if you are deliberate about it, you can practice thinking in other ways. And I think that that's a lot of what meditation is about. Uh, you know, you're, in a sense, you're just practicing thinking about something other than this constant torrent of words. Like if you're meditating on your breath, then you're focusing on a sensation. You're trying to bring your thoughts to that. Uh, there's, well, I don't know. There, there's a lot of techniques for doing that kind of thing. Um, but I think that's a major avenue of not overthinking in that you're trying to develop your skill at thinking in these particular ways and not always reverting back to thinking in a bunch of words. Okay. I have two things. I'm not sure which one to do. Okay. I'll go with the first. The, okay. Here's an example of when I feel as if it, it, it really worked that, that I really hit that state that just worked. Back in high school, junior year, there was a talent show. And I knew one of the people that was, you know, kind of scheduling it. And she kept begging me to sign up for the talent show. And, of course, I was too cool for that. And I was, you know, no. Obviously, I'm, yeah. I'm too cool for that. Whatever. I, I'm not going to do it. But I enjoyed the, the begging, of course. And <laughs> You're a jerk. I know. And so it's, uh, you know, I've said no a hundred times. But the the day before the talent show somebody drops out and then you know she's really you know please please daniel please please take the spot of schedule this out and i'm like oh all right okay fine i'll play but it's 24 hours away i mean it is the next day that i have to play in front of the whole school something i have to do something so you know i realize there's I, I agree to do it, but I realize there is no time to, you know, work on a song or whatever. So I just decide I'm going to make up a song on the spot and just play it in this gymnasium to the whole school. And that's what I'm going to do. Wow. And so I, you know, I, I remember that night I'm kind of thinking through probably, you know, playing some stuff on guitar, just just figuring out a couple, you know, chords or just some ideas that I might be able to play with the next day. But I did not, you know, write a song. I didn't plan it out. I wanted to write it, you know, in front of everyone. And I remember, you know, getting there and I had my giant Fender DeVille amp and my orange Schecter electric guitar. Yep. I had really long blonde hair and a cowboy hat and a Johnny Cash shirt on. And, you know, they, they call my name and I wheel out this giant amp on these squeaky wheels at least that's how i remember it and i i looked down up my guitar you know my cowboy hat i don't know why the hell i was wearing a cowboy hat but it you know it shields my view from the whole crowd and you know i just kind of look down and i just i make up the song and i just play it straight through and there's no 
giant mistakes. It, you know, it's not the most spectacular song on the planet, but sure. it was exactly what I set out to do. And I just wrote this thing in front of everyone. I just improv a song and I felt really good about it. And to me, the, I, the idea of doing that now is so incredibly terrifying. Just, I mean, playing guitar in front of five people now is scary, but to go in front of all, like the whole school and parents and whatever, yeah. and just make something up that I'm not sure is going to work, just give yourself to this, you know, this uncertainty to be able to, to do that. It's just God, like, that's heroic. <laughs> just, I cannot imagine doing that now. And I want that back. I want that sort of that ability because this this wasn't, you know, an isolated incident. It's not like this is the one time it all worked. That's how I played back then. If, yeah. you know, I was sitting making stuff up, I just kind of sunk into this world, completely oblivious to anything else going on. And I w it was just me and music and that's it. It yeah. doesn't mean I was incredible, but it was just everything. I didn't second guess myself. I wasn't you know, constantly worried about what people thought or whatever. I just, you just play music and you're just immersed in this, this world. And I, I think I've lost that ability or, or, you know, I haven't lost it completely, but it's just so different because a couple of years after high school, I started playing, you know, a couple shows by myself. And I remember one of them, you know, it was just me and playing my guitar and singing. I had added the singing. And I was very self-conscious about singing, still am. And uh, I remember I go up and I'm playing the show. I was opening for somebody else. It's this tiny little claustrophobic coffee shop. And it feels so weird to me to just be in front of all of these people. And th this was a couple years out of high school that I had kind of just been more and more isolated just me and myself and not going out and playing in crowds or whatever and i go up there and i start singing but it feels off and i can't hear myself and i just start hating myself and i start hating the situation i start overthinking everything just oh my god why why in the hell am i doing this i can't sing what am i doing i i stop being able to play you know i'm thinking you know i'm thinking about yeah. all the wrong things at the wrong times and it just plummets and it's just the most the complete opposite of the talent show and it's just that, that was the last show i ever played i hated it so much i do not ever want to repeat that i mean i've you know i played in a band a couple uh, years ago which we talked about but yeah i had not played a single show from that horrible hellish incident at the coffee shop until you know a couple years ago because it was just awful. And it's like, you know, night and day. It was the complete opposite of what I had before. And I don't, you know, part of it was confidence and, you know, I just was not confident with singing or whatever, but it, it seemed like there was more to that. I had spent the couple years between those two incidents becoming more and more obsessed with, you know, oh, I need to be the best. I got to practice. This is everything. This is, you know, I'm going to make it. And it just, it, completely twisted it all to where I just, I don't know, I became obsessed with this narrative or this, this idea of things instead of just the music. And, you know, I don't know if it was quite that simple, but it seems that way. No, I, and so, yeah, you know, yeah, well, go ahead. No, I just, it sounds like I, I like the way you kind of frame that up where, you know, with the talent show, with, you know, those early days of high school it's not so much that you it's not so much that you don't think about how other people see you or you don't care or whatever it's that yeah. you're just able to get into that state of mind where the music is all consuming where that's just simply all you're paying attention to whereas you describe this open mic night at the coffee shop or whatever it was and it, the thinking, the obsession, the thing that your mind is on is not that. It's your image of yourself and reputation and, you know, I, I want to right. be good. I want people to think that I'm good. I want to be a good singer. I want whatever, right? But it's not about right. the same thing. It's not the music itself anymore. 
It's the stuff that it feels right. like it is, but it's not. It's actually how you are with the music and everything and the way people see you. And it... Yes. I don't know that I said it very well just now, but I think that's kind of what I was trying to describe a little bit is that there's there's different ways of thinking and there's different things to think about. And in some sense, it's almost like you could look at the talent show itself and say, well, that was a good event. And then you could look at the coffee shop and say, well, that was a bad event. But it's not about that five minutes of talent show or 20 minutes of coffee shop, whatever the little chunk of time was. It's really about everything that happened around that, where you're able to do the talent show because you'd been thinking in the right way for the years leading up to that. You had been practicing mm -hmm. consciously or not thinking the right way. And so it very naturally led into doing the talent show, thinking the right way of just your mind is on the music and that's what you're paying attention to. Whereas leading up to the coffee shop event, you're thinking the wrong way. You're thinking about yeah. yourself a lot in the image. I mean, I'm saying this about you, but I'm extremely familiar with this process. And there's yeah, this, yeah. And then you wind up with this if you have something bad happen, like the coffee shop not working well, that is so dangerous. Like you said, you stopped, right? It, right? And I saw this so many times. I was pretty fortunate to not really have a very bad performance until very late in my school career when I was doing my uh, music performance degree. Because I had, from my own talents or not whatever i i made it through the first few years pretty fortunate to where things pretty much worked out well enough but i saw it go wrong for other people and it it doesn't take much you have somebody go out there they go to do a performance and it goes poorly like sometimes disastrously where they just forget their music and are stuck on stage and don't know what to do i mean it's really an awful feeling you see that happen once and then immediately you know, because of how intense that thing is i, mean, I don't, I don't want to call it a trauma but it, it definitely falls into that category of like one trial learning where something something happens one time but it's so intense that you just it becomes this very visceral reaction to it to where anytime you even think about performing again that of course comes up in your head and it winds yeah. up just really, really reinforcing that mode of thinking where you're thinking about yourself and your image and how you're going to do and how, what people are going to think. And is it going to be good or is it going to be bad? And it, it very much leads you and reinforces you into that type of thinking. Whereas, you know, you're, you're miles away from the, the, the talent show version of you where you're simply focused right. on the music itself or whatever the thing is that you're going to go perform. Uh, right. So to me, the, the takeaway there, and I'm not saying I have any easy answers to this, but I think trying not to focus on the individual event and trying to think about all the time around that, where you're, you're literally practicing how you think and choosing what you think about. That's what right. really adds up to, to being very important there. There's a couple things. One is that, the talent show, I mean, I feel like comparing myself, you know, two years out of high school versus me in high school are almost completely different people because what I was doing in high school, I was playing all the time. I was playing in front of people very often. I was in a band, you know, it was regular that I was playing in front of people. So that wasn't that new to me. I mean, for anyone playing in a gymnasium filled with people, you know, it was, I'm yeah. sure I got somewhat nervous about it, but... I was also told 24 hours before, so I only had one day to think about it. You know, it, it's not like I right. was stewing about this for three weeks, like the coffee shop. And the other thing was, and I think the, the biggest, most important thing for this, looking back, you know, I play that coffee shop and, it, and it's awful. And the reason why it's awful is because I have you know, betted everything on this idea of me being really good. You know, I look at my favorite songwriters and they play coffee shops and they sound amazing. And there's, you know, everyone loves them and I love them. And, you know, I'll listen to live versions of their coffee shop, you know, 
concerts and it's just this magical thing legendary and so when i go to a coffee shop and it right. sucks it's like everything's just been blown to bits my it's an ego thing my ego has been completely shattered and me having such a big ego i decide okay i'll never do that again you know right. i'll show the world i'll just <laughs> never do anything ever again so i can keep that fantasy intact i can keep my ego intact Right. Because as long as I don't do it, I never have to see the failure again. And it's it's stupid and it's pathetic. But well, it's a, I, it's I think, a very natural reaction. Like yeah. you react to try to protect yourself against that kind of pain. And I think the difference is that back in high school, you know, I'm scheduled to play this show. I'm scheduled to play the next show. I know if this show sucks, then the next one I'll just do better, whatever. It's this very, you know, regular thing outside of high school all of a sudden it's it's just up to me i don't play these shows if i don't sign up for them yeah. you know i'm it's just me doing this and i i have to take note of this for art stuff as well because if it's all up to me and i'm afraid to do it i just won't do it and i think that's actually where a lot of adults this is the trap for adults it's not yes there's some brain stuff that goes on but i think it's a lot more the fact that what you do as an adult is up to you. And so with the coffee shop thing, if I had, you know, 30 shows lined up over the next few months, you know, 30 different coffee shops, that one right. would have sucked, but then I would have made sure I did better on the next one. And if that one sucked, I would have tried even harder for the next one and the next one. And I would like to think that if I had kept doing that all the way until now, I probably would have gotten over my fear of playing in a coffee shop you know i'd probably be doing just fine by now yeah but because it wasn't regular because it was up to me i let it all fall apart and i just hid away from it and i think you know i was the same person then a just totally different uh, circumstances totally different environment where things aren't being forced on me and i'm not forced to overcome them i'm just avoiding them completely because i so can so what's the so for this aspect of overthinking what what is the solution there like what should you have done differently i think you need to know that well for one recognizing that it is probably if not completely largely based on ego and you have to swallow that pill because it's not an easy one to swallow no one likes to think of themselves caring about themselves that much or whatever you know right. but it's absolutely an ego thing. It causes so many issues. Like if I, I would not have cared that much if I didn't care so much, you know? Yeah. No, I get so it. So you have to realize that it's an ego thing. The other thing you have to kind of realize is you you need to know that you can try again and succeed. And if you avoid that situation ever occurring again, you know, if you run away from it. You can't, you don't give yourself the chance to overcome it again. And so you train yourself that it's a one and done thing, that you just will never enter that zone ever again. But what I should have done is booked another one and another one and just kept going and going. And I, that's the only way I would have gotten over it. Yeah. I guess it, because before when it was being forced on me, I learned, like it was a learned thing that this is you know this is something you can get over this is something you can just do better next week you know if this goes bad you just fix it again the next week so you have to learn that you can get through this there was um okay i was reading this book that i totally forget the name of i think it's called spark i tried to get you to read it anyway this was a while ago but he was saying that uh you know exercise and physical fitness has such a profound effect on um on mental health and you know everyone says that or whatever but he was yeah. he's bringing up all this science behind it and, and then it becomes a little bit more convincing other than just oh you know fitness is right. good for your brain and it'll make you happy whatever so he was saying that that people who have very strong anxiety i don't know if this would work for everyone blah 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 whatever i don't care yeah, yeah. Okay. He was saying that a lot of people that struggle with heavy anxiety 
if he can get them into running a lot, if he, if he can get those people into a regular running routine, what he, what they find is that that whenever you get anxious about something, you know, you start getting panicked. All of these these responses happen in your body, and you st- and you recognize that, and then you try to avoid the situation. You try to run away or, or whatever. Sure. So when you get into running, a lot of those same things start to happen, but you keep running, and it starts to train your brain that when that response occurs, you can overcome it. You can push through it. Whereas before, your learned response in your brain was to run away from it or to just avoid it or to just hate it and and it gets worse. But when you get into running, you learn that when that response happens, you just push through it. Like you, you are able to do that and your brain learns that ability. So when you go back to the anxiousness, you know, in those situations, your brain remembers, oh yeah, I can push through this. I can, I can get through this. And that is such a, uh, an important thing for your brain to know that, you know, if I go to play a show and I start getting super nervous, I have to know that, oh yeah, I've made it through other shows. I'm going to make it through, you know, mm-hmm. the show in the next week, whatever. So I, I kind of forget where I'm going with that, but I guess just, Knowing that you can push through these things. Um, actually, okay, here's one last example, and then I'll shut up for a little bit. But I started, you know, I, I started getting to know this guy, uh, this other artist. His name's Nacho. I mentioned him a million times before. But I started sharing a lot of my art with him, and he's sharing his art and whatever. I haven't really had an art friend like this really ever. <laughs> so sharing bad drawings with other artists is not something that I'm used to doing. Just like the music, you know, I just right. kind of get away from it. The best things you can find, yes. right? Yeah. And then the thousands of other things I do, I just hide them because I guess my ego or whatever. Like, yeah. you know, you hide the bad stuff. You only want to get praise for the good stuff. Well, when I, I started you know, taking lessons with him and just started working with him on things. And he would make me draw in front of him, which is a nightmare scenario because you have to look like a complete idiot for yeah. certain things. Like, oh, I'm horrible at figure drawing. Well, I can say that before, but to actually prove it to someone <laughs> is so much more painful, you know? Yeah. And, and, but he would force me to do these things. And at first it was just like, you just feel the, the, how the torturous feeling just wash over your back. It's just, it's horrible. Like, God, no, please don't look at this. I hate myself. Don't, don't see it. But after a while, you know, you go through like 20 of those situations and you start to realize, actually, this is good. You know, I do a bad drawing. He corrects it. I learn from it. And now it's this sort of positive experiment or experience. Like I'm kind of, I wouldn't say I'm excited to show him bad drawings, but we've kind of, and it's been with the same way with him too. It's that, you know, we'll give each other critiques and then we kind of argue about it for a while. <laughs> at least it, that's how it was at first. But then you realize, oh yeah, this is good. This is, this is really good. And so your brain switches into interpreting that situation where you're very uncomfortable. It switches from being this really bad thing you need to avoid to being this thing, yeah, let's push through it because that feels good. Just like the running. Let's push through the exercise. At the end, it's going to feel good. Uh, okay. okay, I have like four or five different things in response to my, what you're saying because there's some really interesting points in there. My computer has 25 minutes left, so I'm well, sure we can we can do all this. Right. Okay, yeah, 25 minutes, cool. Oh, uh, We can't... <laughs> If we go any longer, then that's just ridiculous. We need to do part two or something. I don't know. Some of this stuff is just really interesting to me. Okay. First, there's a pretty useful mental framework that I've kind of assembled for myself around exercise, particular lifting, because I've, I've been lifting for a very long time. It's just a sport or hobby, whatever, that I really enjoy. I've been reasonably good at it, you know, considering how much I've done, whatever. Here's what I think is a very useful way to think about it. There's a difference between training and testing. And in the same way, kind of with your, your four-step plan of making your evaluations and then doing the thing, like it, it, it's kind of a similar deal here where you go to the gym 
you want to do your deadlift, you aren't testing your deadlift every time you pick up the barbell. You aren't picking it up and going, oh, I think I'm really strong. I must be doing good. Or, oh, that wasn't so good. I feel weak. I must not be good at lifting. I must be just a weak dude and whatever. You can't do that kind of evaluation and you're not supposed to. There are moments when you test your deadlift where you say, I am going to attempt a weight that I have not done before and I'm hoping that I've gotten stronger to the point where I can do it now. Like you're you're making an evaluation. You're going to test it and you're going to see what happens. And if it works, if you lift 15 pounds more than you did several months ago, then sweet. The training has been working. It's been effective. And that test is, you know, passed or it's positive. If you can't, then you have to kind of think, okay, maybe it's not a very good day for me. Maybe I didn't, you know, I'm not well rested enough, or maybe I just wasn't focused enough. Maybe my form was off, whatever. You can make your evaluations. You could say maybe the training just didn't work. But that's what the test is for, and it's a very isolated thing. Whereas the training is not like that. The training, you show up, you do the programming, you maybe make some notes afterwards, like, oh, this was really hard, it might not be recovering too well, whatever. But you're training. And the, you pick up that barbell, you aren't trying to decide if it's really heavy or it's not, or whatever, how strong you are. If the training's working, you're just, you're doing it. And that's that. And the only real concern there is that you're getting enough stimulus to cause an adaptation in your body. If, if you lift enough, you know, you too much would be too much, too little is too little, but you're trying to lift enough to where your body, your physical body goes, holy crap, that was a lot of weight. I better get stronger. So if we do this again in a few days, I'll be able to handle it and it won't kill me. And that's, that's the process, right? You make that adaptation. So, okay, here's how this applies at all. You think about the coffee shop. It sounds like you're going in there as a test. You're going in there trying to decide if you're good at music and singing and performing and if you're going to be the next Johnny Cash or not. Like, it's a test. Right. But that's a very bad time to test yourself because it's as if you have never picked up a barbell before and you don't really know how to do it. And there's a bunch of other factors. Like, in this case, you know, the monitor is not really working. You can't really hear yourself. So it's kind of hard to know how you're singing and whatever. It's like, plus, it's just a brand new experience. It's like if somebody gave you some weird, twisty, noodle-shaped barbell that you'd never, you don't even know what you're doing, you pick it up, you're like, bah, I'm weak, I guess I better quit. Like, it doesn't make any sense. We all know that doesn't make sense, but it's right. kind of what happened there. So separating those things out and trying to think about that as, I'm not going to perform this show as a test to figure out if I'm good at music. I'm going here as training. I'm probably going to be bad at this because it's super unfamiliar, but I could keep doing it and I could continue to get better and I could train myself to be really good at playing in a coffee shop. Yes, I wish that you had just told me that. <laughs> well, <laughs> then, but yeah, but honestly, I think even if you had told me that, I wouldn't have accepted it because I'm comparing myself to right. all these, you know, other guys that, you know, if you look at their track record, they were just perfect from the, from the time they were eight years old or whatever. Sure. So, you know, and but that's a whole yes, different I, side yeah, of things. But I, but, I completely yeah. agree. Is that I had my expectations in the sky when really they should have been on the ground because this was my first show. My only goal then should have been to just go there, show up, play a single note, and then anything else that happens, I should right. have been happy to have that. Right. But that wasn't the case. So yeah, totally agree. I, it feels like one of the core principles of ours. I feel like we might need to revisit this because I, I don't know that it really comes across the right way but we've been saying that everything is your fault and how yes. you want things to be your fault we might need to kind of rephrase that somehow but the the core thing there and this is what you were talking about with your artist friend you know having to do art that you're really bad at and at first it's revolting and you hate it and you're like no 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 I want to hide this let me only show you the things that I'm good at this is so painful I hate it but if you're kind of able to get yourself in the right mindset and kind of see the long game, it becomes this moment of, oh, this is fantastic because I'm bad at this. And that means that we can put it out there and we can figure it out and I can be better. And then I'm better. I become better at the thing. And that is my goal. And that should be very exciting. What, what sucks and you'll experience this sometimes, like I've certainly gotten into this, this state where it feels like the thing you're working on 
you actually can't really recognize what's wrong. You're like, I, I don't know. I did the thing and it, it seemed fine. I didn't really make any major mistakes and it's just not that great. That's an awful feeling because you're like, I don't know. I don't know how to get better. I don't know what's wrong. I just, it's kind of this like smooth stone where there's nothing to really grab onto of, oh, wait, hold on. Here's a crack. Here's a thing. It's not good. I can fix it. That's exciting because you can go after that thing. You can make it better. And then boom, you are better at the thing. Like it's a very, it's an exciting and wonderful way to think if you can kind of get yourself into that mindset. Um, but it's, I mean, it's tough, but that is ultimately where you want to get to with that kind of thing of like, you know what I performed and I was singing off key, but I recognize that and I can fix that. Let's practice that. And then the next time I can sing closer to on key and it's going to be better and I'll be a better musician. And then there you go. You keep like pushing down that road of making yourself better, but it's this, it's a very different like mental narrative around that thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to respond with, the the running thing, I really, really like that example too. I think I mentioned this before, but I was just kind of reading about this recently, how those feelings you get of anxiety and, you know, nervousness, whatever, they're pretty much just these kind of basic hormones that show up in your body. They get triggered by something, you know, it's adrenaline and it's cortisol and things like that. And the idea that you feel anxious and upset versus you feel excited and you know really ramped up about something like that's a mental narrative thing it's your own kind of brain's way of interpreting these physical things that are happening in your body and it's literally just i mean it's not like you can just switch it on or off right like we've all tried that it's not that easy but it's it's not fundamentally different and i I was experiencing this when I was playing StarCraft a lot, which is a very, very intense game. It requires a ton of focus and it, it just has these really high intensity moments where you wind up. It's just, it ramps up your heart rate. It, it creates those, that, that physical response. And you'll see this. I'll see it in myself. I'll see it in other streamers. But if you're playing like that and you're winning, it can be euphoric. I mean, it feels like you are on drugs. You feel so good. You think you're just on top of the world. It's so exciting. You're so focused. It's just, it's amazing. But then if you're losing, it's like those same base things are there, but you are enraged. I mean, I, and I've seen streamers have meltdowns. They start, I've watched them say things that ruined their career because they were so upset and it's the fundamentally the same thing. It's these these basic hormones that are happening and your your mind is interpreting it in a different way. But it's kind of it's a little bit freeing to kind of recognize that. And what you're describing with the running, I've never thought of it that way, but that's really cool and really fascinating that in a sense when you're doing exercise like that yes, that's exactly what happens. You know, you create your your body makes adrenaline and cortisol and all of those things like you wind up getting your body's very ramped up. It's extremely similar to having a panic attack or, or some level of anxiety. But in that context, I mean, imagine that you were just sitting on the couch and somehow somebody like, poof, magic wand, you feel like you feel when you've just run three miles at race pace. Like you would go, right. holy crap, I think I'm dying. You would freak out. It would be awful. But when you're running, you know what's happening. You're expecting that. You're used to that. And so you interpret it in the right way of, wow, this is hard, but that's fine. I'm not freaking out about it. I know why I'm expecting this. And I know that it's actually good for me in the long run. Right. No pun intended. Like it, it's good for you. So you're very willing to do that. I mean, yes, it's hard, but like, it's fine. You get done. You're like, wow, awesome. I feel good. You know, yes, you're full of stress hormones, but you still feel good because you're interpreting it in this very positive way of yeah this was good for me and that 100 percent applies to those moments too of like that's kind of what you want to get to where you can mentally process those things in the right way to where it feels like excitement and you know you're just hyped up about this thing that you're gonna do like it can feel amazing it can feel euphoric and it's really just an interpretation of your brain and big thing there again with the running thing that i really like is that you can practice that 
practicing that is really important. Trying to find ways of doing that to where you get used to interpreting those feelings and experiencing them in the right way. Okay, so here's a, a really dumb example of that same thing. Okay, cool. Starbucks. So we've gotten at work, after we, we go out to eat, whatever, we've gotten into this habit of just going to Starbucks literally every single day at work. A lot of Starbucks. And we started doing this, I don't know, a couple months ago, and it just became this, this habit, this wonderful habit, you know, grand, grande flat white every okay. day. That's my drink. Anyway, we, I realized, you know, looking at 2023, a very, very easy way to save some money is to just cut out the Starbucks. It's just such a stupid expense. So I decide, okay, no more coffee during the week, or no more Starbucks during the week, except for Fridays. Okay, so I'll, I have one on Friday, but that's that. So I decide this, and then, you know, a Monday comes, you know, whenever, and I, we go to work. Then we go to Starbucks and we're all there and everyone else gets a drink and I'm not getting my drink. And don't let this get lost in the, the idea of being addicted to coffee because I got coffee as soon as I got back to work. It was just disgusting Folgers coffee. Okay. Sure. So I got my fix, but my brain was thinking, I want coffee. I'm at Starbucks. You know, it's a, it's a double star day on the Starbucks rewards. <laughs> get the coffee my, my brain is just you know it's not yeah. the addiction to the to the caffeine it's it's this trained response of you're here you get coffee and i wasn't doing that and it was just this it it was way past like ah, oh, i really want a coffee but i can't get mm -hmm. one today it was way past that it was this what's going on like this i felt so uncomfortable and like so agitated and so angry at this idea in my brain I, I didn't agree with it. So, you know, I get through that day. I mean, it's, God, it sounds so stupid, but it really was like this very mm -hmm. strange, way over the top response to something so stupid. But the next time we go out, I'm like, oh, it'll be fine. Like my brain just had learned, oh, you, you pushed through and now you know that it's okay. Yeah. And it was just funny to watch that. And over just such a stupid thing but yeah no I, it's just the idea that one when you are able to push through some of those responses to weird stimulus it's like it, your brain remembers that and remembers that it's okay and i i wish i had known that type that sort of thing existed you know back with the coffee shop concert or, or I wish I could remember it still with, with bad paintings or drawings. Sometimes I wish I would just show them instead of hide them or whatever. I, I wish I wouldn't avoid that sort of feedback. Yeah. Because, I, I don't know, it, you're avoiding the bad feeling, but I think it you become very powerful if you learn that you can push through those things. What's funny, too, about that is... I mean, you said, okay, you have this experience at Starbucks, but then it, you, it's a dumb example, but it's, I relate to it, right? I get it. Here's my dumb example. You know, we were trying to, we were talking about how phone usage is not very good for you and it really kind of messes with your brain. So I remember the first night that I went to bed without my phone. Yeah. This yeah. sounds pathetic and stupid. I hate to even admit this to people but i'm in there like what do i do? i was like feeling panicked almost of what if i can't sleep what if i don't know i need it or something it just it felt so wrong and then the next day you're like okay that was fine nothing horrible yeah. happened and then the next night you're like okay i can go to bed without a phone and then a few days into it it's like oh this is so nice I just, I no longer have to deal with this thing right by my head that wants to distract me and helps keep me up and whatever. Like you just adjust to it. But what I think is kind of funny about that is that pretty soon you just forget that it was hard before. Your brain just fully adjusts to where it just isn't a big deal. I, probably 10 years ago, I decided I wanted to start doing intermittent fasting. It's like a eating pattern. 
which or you know time restricted feeding where you you only eat in like an eight hour window in the day that's what it was for me basically that boiled down to i would not eat breakfast i would eat my first meal at you know 12 or 1 and then have dinner and that was it and that was kind of a way for me to restrict my food and i still think that's a pretty good eating pattern for anybody who's hunting for a way of cutting their calories down a little bit but at first it sucked like you skip breakfast and then you're just hungry and it feels weird and you're like uh i want to eat i feel like i'm starving i don't like this i'm uncomfortable and whatever but so now very recently i tried to start eating breakfast again i was thinking you know what i really don't need to be doing intermittent fasting or the very least i'd rather have my calories earlier in the day and i'm trying to eat breakfast and i can't it is awful it is just like it feels like i'm force feeding myself I hate it, hate it, because I am just so fully, thoroughly adjusted to not eating breakfast that now it is, I can't do it. I mean, I'm struggling to even get myself to eat breakfast, but I, I just completely forgot that transition period at the start. So my point here is that you talk to somebody who, let's say, is a really good performer. You know, they are a musician. They're always comfortable. They get up in front of an audience and they play and they perform and they have good energy and they interact with the audience or whatever. And they make a mistake and they don't really care that much. And they just keep going like they're just good at that. And it, you talk to them and it's it, it almost feels like this huge chasm of like, how do you do that? Like, I don't know, I just do it or whatever. But in all likelihood, it was hard for them at some point, and they made the adaptation. Maybe it took a long time, maybe it didn't. But once you're kind of down that road, as long as nothing really dramatic happens, that's just kind of you. You just get used to it. You kind of pretend, or not pretend, but it just feels like that's how it's always been. Like, yeah, of course I go to bed without a phone because... Ugh, gross, I don't need that. Like, I'd just rather read a book and go to sleep. And But th that was not me at all two years ago so it's easy to take for granted that beginning period of making that transition into getting yourself to think a certain way because for somebody who has it doesn't feel like that they're not going oh man it was such a long road it was so difficult i can't even tell you i finally made it though it's cool now it, just, it doesn't feel that way it just feels like oh yeah i don't know it's just what i do you just just how it feels but it doesn't mean that that transition period isn't super important. Okay, I know that your computer is about to shut off in seven minutes. Yeah. I got a little longer than that, but yeah, let's let's okay recap. Let's wrap this up. Yeah. So the overthinking is bad, but really, what that means is a little bit different than what we typically think overthinking is, right? Yes. Like I I I think what we're trying to say is that. It's not so much that you're technically overthinking. It's that you're thinking about the wrong things at the wrong time. Yeah. Right? Yes. I, I, I very much stand by that particular definition. And the, the couple avenues we've talked about here. One is the decision making. Where decisions need to be a singular point in time where you make a choice. And the mistake that we very, very often make is to not make the decision at a particular point. You just let that decision keep getting constantly made and rehashed and rethought over a long stretch of time. So I, I, if you put that in practice, it starts to become really clear what that means and how powerful that I, is, but you really don't want to be making decisions constantly. Honestly, this is why to-do lists are helpful. I mean, this is why they're so popular is that it's, if you wake, I don't always make to-do lists, but yeah. I do often because you're you're putting your decisions on paper. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. You're thinking about the big picture. What do you need to get done today? Let's list them out, whatever, to-do list. Yeah. That's just putting those decisions up front. Yeah, you're preventing yourself from having to be making those decisions all day and questioning them all the time. Yeah, right. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, the other thing here was the more... This is a little bit fuzzier, I think, but the, the performance aspect where you're really trying to have your mind in a very particular state for something like a music performance or, or something that you know requires you to not be having this big mental dialogue where you're you're really trying to focus on something that isn't this mental narrative you have going all the time like you said 
you had this really excellent, impressive performance at the high school talent show because you were focused on the music itself, not extremely wrapped up in your own self-image. There's a lot of things around that, you know, just your circumstance, the way you view yourself. You know, I can just say from my time teaching people, I'm, I know you experience this too, right? But we both used to do private lessons. Adults could be so difficult to teach and everyone thinks it's because their brains are different. I would like to punch every single one of those people because I just think they're so wrong. It's not some physical fundamental difference. It's that adults have such a powerful self-identity where it becomes really difficult for them to kind of expose themselves in a way, you know, they have to play the guitar, play the piano in a way that's bad. It's going to be bad. They're brand new to it, but they have to do that and kind of accept that it's going to suck and let somebody help them and point out the problems and slowly work their way through it. Adults find that very, very uncomfortable. Whereas a kid, their self-identity is nowhere near that level of develop because they're a kid. Every single thing they do, they suck at because they're brand new to the world. They're just, they're bad at life. And so that's how they operate. And so kids are so much more willing to do that. They'll sit there and they'll bang on a guitar, making all kinds of awful noise while you're trying to talk to them because they just don't give a crap. It's just, they, they're not worried about how they look or how they feel. And so that makes them so much more able to play and, and you can work with them, right? So adults have a hard time with this. And that's just, I think, a thing you got to recognize and really look to practice not hiding behind that super strong self-identity like you said when you're trying to perform at a coffee shop you wind up you know thinking so hard about you as a musician and your career and how you stack up against all the greats and you know people are going to think this or that and like that's all the wrong things to think and the type of thinking that you want to do needs to be practiced like it's not something you just switch on and off in the moment it's something you you rehearse and work on is thinking the right way over time and sometimes that kind of thinking isn't even it's not what we often think of as thinking it can be a focus on your body or on you know the muscle memory or visualization and it's you know you're thinking about those things and not literal words is that a good recap yeah i'm debating on saying okay Now I lost my train of thought. I have, there's more I want to say in this. Maybe we do kind of a follow-up episode soon, but there's another thing. I'll just mention it in like 20 seconds. Practicing diverting thoughts is, I think, really important. This is something they talk about in cognitive behavioral therapy and things like that and meditation where you have your four-step plan, right? Your theory, make a plan, you do the thing, and then you evaluate. Like, okay, you're doing the thing Thoughts keep entering your head of, this is a bad idea. I should do this instead. Like you're getting the evaluation thoughts at the wrong time. And I, like the, the thing you practice with that, the, the Zen way of, you know, fighting your way through that is to just kind of take those thoughts and acknowledge that they happen and then put them off to the side. For me, I have a, a little text document where if I get a thought like that of, oh, what if I should do this instead? I just write it down. It's really quick. I try not to spend too much time on it. I just put it down. I'll evaluate it later and I go right back to the thing. And just practicing that is a really excellent way of just getting better at thinking about the thing you want to be thinking about. Absolutely, yes. Okay, when I first started my job, I had to start learning Photoshop and I had only used it like just barely before that. So I get to work and I have these huge jobs that I have to do in Photoshop and I suck at Photoshop yeah. and you know, I'm, I'll start working on a piece. It's going well, whatever, which already difficult enough. And then all of a sudden I don't know how to, uh, I don't know, find the transform tool or I don't know how to flip the canvas horizontally or, or whatever. And it just, I, now I have to spend half a day trying to figure that out. And now I'm thinking about all the wrong things. Right. I'm thinking about little tools I have to use. What are the stupid hotkeys, whatever. Like I'm so, I then become so frustrated with these like little insignificant things when I need to be thinking about the big picture. And, it, and in a case like that, you know, I don't want to think about those things, but I kind of have to think about those things. 
because I, I need to know them in order to do the piece. But I think in that situation, I should do exactly what you just said, is you do as much as you can. And as those things start to pop up, I've done this with drawing too about a year ago. Now I want to talk about a bunch of different things. But as those problems start coming up, you kind of take note of them. And if you can do without them, do without them. Get as far as you can and start making a, a little list or just, you know, take mental note of all of these things that you need to look up and you need to go find. But get as far as you can without them. And then break, solve those problems. Right. Solve those small problems. But you you want, you don't want to train your brain to stop every time you run into a difficulty. Every time you make a wrong mark when you're drawing, you don't want to stop and go, oh, it's suck at art. Oh, I need to figure out how to do this. It's, oh, that's interesting that I just messed that up. Let's keep going. And you keep going. Oh, that's interesting. I need to look that up later. And you keep going as far as you can. And then you break and you switch modes into solve the problem mode. And being able to separate those, I think, is yeah. is extremely valuable. Or just practicing being in the right mental state and staying in that mental state for that period of time that you're trying to be in it. All right, right. we've seriously got to go. I'm, okay. I, can't, I can't, even if your computer, even if we have time, I'm too anxious about you suddenly disappearing and everything breaking. So I know. I would like to do a follow-up episode to this, maybe not next week, but the week after or something, because there's really a lot that I would love to talk about here. There's a lot of different aspects to this. So next week, I think the plan, I want to talk about the three-month plans. Two months plans? Two, oh, two, okay. No. <laughs> I want to talk about the three-month plans that we've both been working on. So if you're somebody out there and you want to kind of think this way too, have maybe that's something you could you could post or talk about or whatever that that'll be the discussion for for next week is what do we want things to look like for the next three months so thanks everybody for listening on all our different platforms we'll see you next week get your three-month plan ready